the ability to not have to pay ourselves from the business in the early days was key to being able to use those resources for growth. Welcome to Honesty Commerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Honest E-Commerce. Today, I'm welcoming to the show not one, but two amazing founders. I've got Kaylee and Kelly joining me from Slumberkins, a leading direct-to-consumer children's brand that provides tools and resources to support little ones, families, caregivers, and educators with early emotional learning. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to be here. Absolutely. So for... The listeners that are unaware of Slumberkins, can you quickly... What are the types of products you guys are currently selling online? So Slumberkins is mostly known for our uh, book and plush bundle. So what that means is we have characters that represent different emotional skills um, that we as founders being an educator and a therapist um, kind of built a brand that has um, tools for families and parents and kids around teaching children early emotional learning skills. So, but our primary product online is a combination of books, books that teach the lessons and plush characters that are like the candy for the kids. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely. So take me back in time. Where did the idea for this business come from? Was that the the first idea or did you get there eventually? Well, it's it's a long goes way back because Kaylee and I have been best friends since we were 14 years old. We uh, met in high school and sort of did life parallel to each other. We were both D1 athletes, went to college, and then after college, went into our respective careers in um, myself into marriage and family therapy and school counseling, Kaylee into special ed. And just because we were doing life around the same time, we serendipitously ended up on a maternity leave at the same time with our sons. They were born two months apart. So when we were walking around on our maternity leave, talking about um, what we were seeing in the schools and the students and families that we were working with, which was actually quite concerning at the time, and this was pre-pandemic, um, of the rise of mental health issues, behavioral health issues, parents feeling overwhelmed and not knowing how to support their kids, really trying to you know get them into groups with us or hand them over to us to fix, quote unquote. And... Um, with, we were inspired by our own babies and thought, you know what, there's so many easy turnkey things that parents can be doing from the moment children are born until they get to school that we can empower parents and give them those tools through basically scripted stories. So we started by borrowing $200 from my mom, going to Joanne Fabric and sewing our first creatures, pairing them with these stories and selling at craft fairs. And it was really going to be a kind of mom-made, teacher-made side hustle. Um, but because of, I think, right product, right time, you know, just everything hitting... Um, a community really built around the brand through Instagram and Facebook groups at the time and helped catapult us into, you know, ending up quitting our jobs in education and going full time for Slumberkins um, as we grew the brand. That's amazing. Uh, my, I guess my follow up question would be obviously, this didn't happen overnight. So, with uh, once you kind of made the first creature, as you said, um, and you started to sell at, at craft fairs. How long were you kind of in the trenches getting that direct feedback from people at craft fairs before it kind of started to snowball a bit? So we did three craft fairs in the, we're from the Pacific Northwest in the Portland, Oregon area. And so we did three craft fairs and it was the last, on, at the last one, we were also, it was kind of nearing the time we needed to go back to our roles as in the classroom too. Maternity leave was coming to an end we kind of looked at each other and we're like, we want to keep going. Like this doesn't end. Like we're getting such great feedback. We keep selling out of these class craft fairs. So the first step we took was to open up an Etsy shop and just put some online. And we had an Instagram account that was driving all like awareness and traffic for what we were doing. Um, and I think the magic of 
we found like a very unique like niche and we had a different like product. We did a lot of research in the early days over if anything like this ever existed in the market and even took the step to take our handmade version of Slumberkins of we had Bigfoot and Sloth at the time and took it to an IP lawyer in Portland and was like, we want to trademark this. <laughs> we want like, a design. We want a design patent. We want to trademark Slumberkins. We like did all of this stuff because we had a bigger vision knowing how powerful story, storytelling is for kids and families and learning. Um, and so we did those right things before we even paid ourselves in the business. But for context in the first year, so 2016 is when we put them in, in January, like December, January, 2016 was when we put them online. And in the year of 2016, we hand sewed like 4,000 slumberkins. <laughs> like it was insane. Like we couldn't keep up with demand because of, and it was all organic at that point, because I also think there was something around like, we couldn't keep up with sewing them fast enough that then we would like sew batches and then people couldn't get their hands on them because we'd sell through like 300 at a time. And it just became this like tidal wave of not being able to keep up. And the power of social media back in 2016 from an organic lens was completely different than it is today. <laughs> That's amazing. How long uh, did it take you to find uh, a manufacturing partner that you trusted to <laughs> take what I'm assuming is one of the biggest uh, time sucks off your plate? Yeah, that was one actually area where um, because of how fast it was moving, we were also really caught up in doing the production ourselves. A lot of the people who were our customers loved that it was handmade. And um, it was a moment where Kaylee and I had to really take a step back. And in the early days, we had done like a little one pager business overview that her old basketball coach had given us because we weren't business people <laughs> at all. But one of the questions on there was, what's your big, hairy, audacious goal? Like, you'll know you've made it when and finish that sentence. And back then we said, when there's slumberkins on ice. <laughs> so we had like this big vision of like, you know, getting to a place where our characters would be, you know, at coliseums. And so we got to this point where we were like, there's no way we can continue selling these <laughs> ourselves if that's our goal. And so in that time, again, no idea how to find a manufacturer. Google page 12 found somebody who was in LA that worked, I, you know, Googled like who makes Disney's products, who makes Ikea products um, and kind of went for the top and just tried to connect with people that I found contacts for and just kind of struck gold in talking to somebody who was much too big for us at the time. But because um, I approached it from a place of information gathering, collaboration, asking questions, trying to understand, not making it transactional from the very first moment. Um, we were able to kind of create a deeper relationship where that person was sort of mentoring and helping me maybe find a lower level manufacturer that we could actually work with. But when the time came to make that order, that person didn't have the paperwork that was needed to kind of prove that it was like, all buttoned up for child safety, child labor law safety. And because we had built a relationship with this person, he was like, ah, I can't watch you do it. And I'm going to lower my MLQs for you. And so we were able to enter in with a very high quality uh, manufacturer from the get go. Um, it was a stress uh, stretch for us at the time. And that was when we first took in our first money into the business to try to get that purchase order done. But it all serendipitously happened at the right time because we ended up going on Shark Tank. And the day we were on Shark Tank, we sold out of all of our handmade products before we even aired. And so we ended up having to sell that first batch of overseas made products on the day that Shark Tank aired. And we had to air freight it over, package it ourselves, send it out, miss Christmas, holidays, everything ourselves. So it was just like a, you know, true bootstrapped <laughs> learning process over here. Um, that's, that's amazing. Uh, so obviously, we're gonna talk about Shark Tank. Um, we'll get to that here in a second. So with finding this partner, um, what else was going on in the business? Were you still on Etsy? Had you graduated to your own dot com? Um, were you still just kind of growing organically through social? Or had you started to learn uh, to explore other channels for growth? Yeah, so we ended up switching from Etsy to Shopify back in summer of 2016. So midway through that year, uh, we just realized we were outgrowing Etsy and we needed to develop our own website and brand and all of that. So as soon as we had the trademark 
filed for Slumberkins. We went to work on opening up our first Shopify site. Um, and yes, so from 2016 to basically mid 2018. So we went on Shark Tank with almost a million dollars in revenue behind us with no paid marketing or advertising. We were like purely organic word of mouth via social media was like how customers were finding us. And then we really bootstrapped the brand. Shark Tank was an amazing opportunity, but we bootstrapped the brand to 1.5 million before we took in our first investment round. Um, and that's something that I look back on and I'm like, oh, I don't know how we did it. <laughs> it was like, it never felt like a grind though. Like, yes, we were slammed. We were so busy, but it was more this like tidal wave of traction that was just kind of like forcing us to try to keep up. Um, which, you know, it's fast forward to today. It's quite different. <laughs> Absolutely. We've, we're kind of jumping all over the place, but I do want to go back and ask specifically. Um, now, did you return to work after maternity leave, or did you kind of see what was going on and just, just jump, you know, feet first into Slumberkins? We did both return after maternity leave. Um, I went back part time. Kaylee went back full time, but our hearts were always with Slumberkins, and we were really excited about it and trying to figure out ways to keep it going while we were both still working in the schools. The moment that we decided we're, we're going all in was when we got the call that we are filming for Shark Tank. Our only business experience at that time was like literally watching all the episodes of Shark Tank. So we were like, they're going to ask us if we're all in. So we have to be able to say yes. So we just called our principals and uh, said, sorry, we're going on Shark Tank. So we're taking a leave and um, kind of haven't looked back since then. And what year was that? That was 2017. So we went back for a year after our maternity leave ended We and worked for a year. And then, but at that time we had hired some contract seamstresses in the Portland area to help us with the sewing. So, you know, while we were teaching, they were sewing and we were doing like full-time slumberkins and full-time teaching. It was a grind, but the ability to not have to pay ourselves from the business in the early days was key to being able to use those resources for growth of like buying more fabric for, to make more sewing, to be able to file like trademarks and IP protection, like making those types of investments in the brand early is what has set us up for success. And we couldn't have afforded that had we been taking the salaries, you know, that we were using or that we were getting from being educators. Absolutely. I think there are probably some listeners out there right now that are in a similar situation where they have are starting to find product market fit uh, and they don't necessarily know when is the right time to go all in. Not everybody gets a call that says you're going to go on Shark Tank to really be the kick in the butt to make that decision. Is there anything that you can remember from your experience or looking back on maybe a little bit earlier you should have taken that leap or you know what should what should entrepreneurs be looking at? I think for us, um, we just come from a team mindset and collaboration. So every time we would start to feel overwhelmed. And like Kaylee said, there was this push and traction behind us. So there was sort of this energy behind like, Oh, we could, we're leaving things on the table. Um, and when we had that momentum, making sure that we hired or got people there to help us, especially with tasks that were easily done by others like customer service, like helping with the shipping, all of this stuff, like those hires were really important um, to get off of our plate so we could keep thinking bigger for the brand. Um, so again, we paid people before we paid ourselves to get that groundwork set up. And then even when we did start paying ourselves a little bit, because we took the leap and said, okay, no more at the schools, we split a salary. <laughs> so we were like making basically part-time school work uh, salaries. So we kept our salaries very low to make sure the company could, could handle it. We could take those growth steps that we needed. So we didn't, we didn't make the plan of like, I need to replace my salary at the level that I'm accustomed to. We really took that hit in the beginning and put the blood, sweat and tears into the business. And I would say that over the long run, 
really helped us stabilize Slumberkins, understand and take in money at the right time. And we sort of did it by accident by just being conservative teachers and used to not spending a lot of money and having a glamorous lifestyle. You know, (laughs) we were used to that. So we just kind of stayed within those means as long as possible while building the business. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So Let's move forward a little bit now. You are on Shark Tank. It airs. You sell out of... Is it the entire order that... Entire first order sells out? Not of the... Well, close to. In that holiday season, we ended up selling through that entire first order. We attribute Shark Tank to about... uh, It was like $150,000 in revenue. If we look at like the air date, like Mm -hmm. website traffic. So it wasn't like some of the experiences that others have had of like, it was, you know, millions of dollars when you air, but in the way that um, the streaming world works these days, like we just had someone DM us on Slumberkins or right on Facebook saying, Oh, I just watched your Shark Tank episode because people watch, people watch and consume media in different ways than previously in the early, you know, in the, you know, even 10 years ago. So we kind of have this like trickle effect of brand awareness that comes in from, from, that experience. And, you know, I honestly think even the process of going on Shark Tank, the filling out of even the paperwork made us better business owners or like being able to like, even button up all the things that we didn't even realize we didn't have together that they want to go through in their diligence process, like did kind of make it a lot more serious over like, Oh, okay, we need to have this together. Oh, okay. We need to have that together. <laughs> like, um, so just going through that experience, I would encourage anyone, any entrepreneur to apply because the, the application process is like, it's just a good, it's like business school. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so you, you, air on Shark Tank and you've got some nice momentum behind you. How do you capitalize on everything that you have going for you uh, and kind of sustain that growth? Uh, You know, you can't guarantee that you're going to be on Shark Tank as an entrepreneur. You can't guarantee a celebrity is going to wear your t-shirt. So what else are you doing to make sure that you're maintaining this momentum and this goodwill that you've won? Number one, I would say build a community. Like, have a direct relationship with your consumer, get to know them. Um, Really, we ended up um, growing pretty organically from a community on social media and then ended up like developing a Facebook group, which was our kind of like, you know, most like conversational community about the brand. And I think there's just something really special about when a consumer, I mean, we know that consumers like to um, buy from brands that they feel like they like, know, and trust. And I feel like Kelly and I do a lot of just engaging with them. And our primary customer are parents and we are parents. And so we just, we show up and we're really authentic with them. And they, they see the behind the scenes over what we deal with as, as customers or as entrepreneurs and business owners so much because we're pretty transparent with them when something does go wrong. You know, when a PO is going to be late and they've pre-ordered it and they just have to wait longer, we are transparent with them in that like, that's on us. This really sucks. But they also are the most like patient because they see the humans and they connect with the humans behind the brand. Um, so yeah, that was like the, that's been our like key differentiator is the the community that we've built. Hey there, Merchant. Are you tired of trying to navigate the wild world of e-commerce on your own? Are you looking for a partner to help you achieve your goals? Look no further than the Shopify Plus agency, Electric Eye. Our team has a proven track record of helping our clients make millions with strategic design and development. Whether you're migrating from a legacy platform to Shopify, designing a new theme for your store, or just looking to optimize what you already have, Electric Eye is the perfect partner for you. Electric Eye are true Shopify experts. Not only is our Shopify knowledge unparalleled, but we have partnerships with all the best tech in the Shopify ecosystem. And don't worry, we're easy to get a hold of. Our clients rave about our fast communication. So here's the deal. If you're an e-commerce business doing over $1 million a year, you can receive a complimentary Shopify diagnostic from our team of experts. That's free, personalized strategic recommendations to improve your store and grow your business. To get started, head on over to electriceye.io slash connect to schedule an intro call with one of our experts. That's electriceye.io slash connect. 
Are you tired of your cash flow being tied up in inventory that takes ages to arrive from China? How many times have you missed out on potential sales during peak season due to inventory delays? Well, here's some news that might just change the game for you. Imagine increasing your lead time by 10x without ordering inventory in advance, reducing your inventory risk by over 66%, and enjoying three times better cash flow. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, with Portless, this dream can become a reality. In the unpredictable world of inventory projections and holiday rushes, Portless is your reliable partner. They ship your products directly from China to your customers, keeping you stocked without the burden of additional storage fees. Say goodbye to the hassle of ordering inventory in advance. With Portless, you have access to factory MOQs and can replenish fast-moving products in just three to five days. Capitalize on demand, eliminate wastage, and get your precious inventory ready for sale within two to four days of manufacturing. Manufacturing, no more waiting 45 to 60 days for cargo ship arrivals. Shipping to over 55 countries from their fulfillment center in China, Portless ensures your customers enjoy a seamless domestic experience with six day shipping and last mile tracking from trusted carriers like USPS, Royal Mail, and Canada Post. The best part? It's cost effective. Portless helps you improve your gross margins by up to 40% thanks to Section 321, eliminating fees and costs associated with traditional fulfillment options. Not only that, Portless ensures your products reach your customers on time while retaining the full domestic experience. Your customers can conveniently track their orders and you get to keep the custom packaging they love. If you sign up before March 30th and mention this podcast, Honest E-Commerce, you'll get 20 cents off your pick and pack fees for every order for the first three months. That means if you're doing 10,000 orders a month, that's $2,000 a month in total savings, $6,000 for your first three months. But remember, you have to contact Portless before March 30th to get this deal. Ready to revolutionize your inventory and fulfillment process? Visit portless.com today and let them help you with your inventory and fulfillment needs. Hey, everybody. Today's podcast is brought to you by IntelliGems, the ultimate profit optimization tool for Shopify merchants. I'm telling you this. Obviously, you know I own an agency. We use IntelliGems when we're running split testing and CRO stuff for all of our clients. Are you looking to maximize your profits? IntelliGems offers data-driven solutions to optimize your content, prices, discounts, and shipping rates. Join over 500 happy clients who have seen significant improvements. With IntelliGems, you gain control over your e-commerce economics, boosting your profit per visitor by an astonishing 36%. But that's not all. IntelliGem users report a 54.62 increase in revenue per visitor and a remarkable rise in conversion rates. How does IntelliGems do it? Through a suite of tools that allows you to A-B test everything on your Shopify store, from landing pages to product prices and shipping rates. Imagine testing new layouts, offers, even a new Shopify theme with ease. We're testing a new landing page for our client on a new theme versus an old landing page on their old theme right now. IntelliGems empowers you to find the perfect price point for your products and optimize your shipping strategy. But there's more. Boost your average order value with customized campaign offers and discover if your customers prefer free shipping or a lower list price. With over $100 million in incremental profit generated, they have over 1.5 billion transactions ran through their software. They have over 400 million shoppers that have gone through their test. Intelligence is not a tool. It's a game changer for your business. Are you ready to transform your Shopify store's profitability? Book a demo today at IntelliGems.io. Empower your brand to reach new heights. Again, that's IntelliGems.io. IntelliGems, giving superpowers to your customer acquisition, retention, and overall profitability. Since Shark Tank and, and all of these years, you guys have had some uh, other amazing things kind of happen. Um, talk to me about, uh, I, you know, the TV show, how did that come into reality? Yeah, we, um, so after Shark Tank, there was a little bit of a surplus of cash because we, you know, sold more than we expected in that holiday season. And so Kaylee and I, again, thinking of our Slumberkins on Ice big dream, we sort of, you know, let the team keep things running. And we took, uh, some cash off the, you know, out of that budget and said, we're going to bring one of our characters to life. So we had this whole plan <laughs> that was probably short-sighted, but, you know, 
typical founder <laughs> move here. We're like, we're going to build a puppet. And so we're going to make Bigfoot a YouTube star. So we kind of started on this journey of like, we're going to bring one of them to life ourselves. Cause that's as teachers, we just knew how to do that on our own or just strap things on our back. Well, we ended up going to a conference um, called the Altitude Summit and meeting at a dinner the president of television for the Henson Company, which we had chosen to do a puppet because I was really a big Henson nerd when I was younger, loved puppets. So we met her at a dinner and said, oh my gosh, we have a brand. Look, we're, we built a puppet. <laughs> we're going to make TV show. And she was like, what's happening here? This is amazing. Like, why are you doing this alone? We should be working together. Um, so we ended up just serendipitously getting in touch with her and she fell in love with the brand. She was a, a single mom at the time with a kid who had anxiety, really resonated deeply with the messages and the ideas that we were building within the brand. Um, and so it was kind of a non-traditional path because I think most of the time you set your sights on going and pitching and, um, you know, Henson was like a really organic, uh, connection that we made and kind of led us through the process of how, how we do that. So we did go through that whole process of developing a show, pitching it to networks and, um, you know, all along the way, I think Kaylee and I were from, from the moment we met her, we were like, Oh, we're going to have a TV show. Now that we're on the other side of it, we realize how special that is and how many don't end up happening or get to that place and fall through. But I think our excitement, our belief in it, the like magic of how it happened, the real relationships we made along the way that felt so authentic just carried it all the way through to, to airing, which has been such an incredible experience. We pinch ourselves every day that that actually happened. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been able to ask this follow up question. How does the impact of a television series like what's that impact to like the sales of the product? Uh, how do you correlate that? Our partner, our streaming partner is Apple TV Plus. Apple is notorious for not sharing viewer data, so it can be pretty hard to uh, track. So, uh, but we did see the way that we've attributed it is from an e com perspective in a couple of ways. Organic search definitely spiked upon like airing of the first season, the search for Slumberkins. Same thing on search on Amazon for Slumberkins, which is a more traditional like toy channel for a lot of place it for a lot of people looking for things. Um, and then we do post purchase surveys over how did you hear about Slumberkins? And we do that on the e-com side, but then we pull our community in our Facebook group all the time too. And so we, we have more like anecdotal data that kind of shows. And, you know, we did see like a, an uptick specifically in website traffic over that time period. And I would say like a slight uptick. That being said, I will say that, um, TV shows, especially in today's age of streaming, also so heavily depend on a good marketing budget and support specifically for that show. So, you know, it's it's one of those things that um, Apple like loved the brand. Apple loved the community that we the community that we've built. This is another way that we leveraged leveraged our community. When we went to pitch networks, we actually put together a chat book of photos of um, our customers and their kids and their love for Slumberkins and a parent testimonial asking for a show. And so we had like 50 testimonials that we left with these network executives basically saying, hey, I have a built in like viewer base, like asking for a show. Um, and so being able to leverage that was an incredible thing to be able to kind of show the power of the community. And I think was part of like why Apple was so interested as well. I think on a show as well, um, just with the nature of streaming, again, that halo effect and the awareness, <clears throat> it takes a little time to build. Um, so it's not like probably in the old days when it was like cable or network when, you know, everybody was sitting around waiting for a show to, to drop unless you have that huge marketing budget and you're, you know, Ted Lasso or whoever. <laughs> um, so there's that, but we also saw a lot because the, the show aired in, um, globally in 22 languages. We've definitely seen uptick in our international market starting to open up and bring in questions about distribution into different countries that were kind of non-existent interest or awareness before. 
Um, and alongside that, as you have a TV show, the opportunities for omni-channel, for licensing, for going into different areas beyond just like what we have been doing on D2C, um, those doors start opening as well. So we've really been able to leverage and build out, um, use the awareness also as a inroads to expanding the Slumberkins footprint as an IP brand franchise, not just a product that's DTC. That's amazing. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask about is you guys just launched your new affirmation app on iTunes. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the app um, mirrors our publishing program. So all of our characters are 15 characters that span, you know, more proactive things that all parents want for their kids. So building self-esteem, practicing gratitude, practicing mindfulness, uh, being authentic, all of those skills all the way through to supporting grief and loss, coping with anxiety, coping with change. Um, so a span of 15 characters. Each of those characters has two core books in their collection. And then every book that we have ends in a, in an interactive affirmation. And so what we did is we took those affirmations and um, built them into the app that then make it more fun and engaging for kids to be able to practice the affirmation that they're hearing and learning when they're reading the books with their parents. So as educators, we look at it as like a tool to like extend the learning and being able to do the affirmations in a different part of the day where, you know, if you're reading the books with your kids at bedtime, the affirmation app is something that you can do when you're, you know, sitting in a restaurant waiting for <laughs> your dinner to be served. So just trying to find all of the ways that slumber kids can support parents throughout the day with, you know, just building these different little, little like moments that are important um, in these like emotional skill building um, times. That's amazing. Um, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you think would resonate with our audience? I'm curious from like your side, from an e-commerce standpoint, you know, like we've had like a lot of success, especially in the early days with organic growth, you know, like being able to bootstrap a company to 1.5 million, being able to like raise, I mean, at this point we've raised venture capital and, you know, I think there's a difference, something that like, I think that has clicked with us a lot and that we've experienced as founders is even understanding the like painful things about growth and scaling an e-commerce brand. <laughs> like that I remember one of our investors saying to us, the team that got you from zero to 7 million is not the same team that can take you from that 10 million to a hundred million. Like that's just a completely different like skill set and like ability to scale a brand to that level. Like, and like just understanding how much now like brands really depend on a lot of uh, con the content machine is real, but just like the reality that is group scaling like starting the brand is one thing and getting it off its, off its, um, you know, like getting it going is one hurdle. The next hurdle is then like scaling and maintain, maintaining and then scaling. Um, and that's where, you know, we, along with a lot of other e-com brands that have really strong brands are still working. It's a constant grind now, you know, like it's, it's everything is evolving. Like the world of organic content is a different beast than it was seven years ago. It's like, it's a completely different way of operating. So I think it's just like good to just be like open and transparent uh, for people to like know that <laughs> even when you have a TV show, even when you have licensing opportunities out there, even when you are like a established DTC brand that's been here for eight years at this point, like it's still a grind <laughs> behind the scenes. And we're still on the roller coaster emotionally the same way that we were on in the early days. <laughs> I doesn't, that's another thing to tell founders or people who are starting their business. I can't like the farce is that, Oh, I'm going to get to the next level and it's going to stop being so intense and like a roller coaster. Stop fooling yourself. It never stops being that. It will only be that with more pressure, more weight and heavier decisions. So get used to it. Enjoy it. Embrace that part of your personality if you are a founder and you're doing this because that is what we're signing up for. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly and Kaylee, for coming on the show today. We'll link to all the fun stuff that you have going on in the show notes. And I'm sure I'll have you back to talk more about this stuff later on. Thank you so much for having us.
Thank you. We can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own businesses. You can find all the links in the show notes. You can subscribe to the newsletter at honestycommerce.co to get each episode delivered right into your inbox. If you're enjoying this content, consider leaving a review on iTunes. That really helps us out. Lastly, if you're a store owner looking for an amazing partner to help you get your Shopify store to the next level, reach out to Electric Eye at electriceye.io. Until next time.